We should be recording at this point. And Kimber, you, you're up to you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. Um, oh, it's just two o'clock now um, to let people join. I'll just maybe wait until uh, two minutes past the hour because people will be um, joining from other meetings that end on the hour. Okay, that's fine. Okay, and I want to welcome everybody to our spring seminar series here in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences. This seminar series is a little bit of a departure from previous ones in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences in that we have uh, some new co-sponsors. Uh, we are sponsoring this with the Global Public Health Minor and also the Institute of Health and Humanities. So what we've put together here is a spring term full of speakers from uh, lots of different um, community-based or non-government organizations um, who are gonna be talking to us about their work in the global health space. And they're also gonna be taking a perspective that I've really encouraged in them in that, um, they're gonna be thinking about global health work, not just from a, the perspective of a clinician, which is really very frequently what we see in, in seminar series like this, although some of them are clinicians. What I've encouraged them to do is to take a, a, a broad perspective and a holistic perspective on thinking about teaching you or sharing with you about all of the different multidisciplinary perspectives and approaches that really need to come together to make a successful global health initiative. And so you'll see that reflected in the, in the um, list of speakers that we have uh, in store for you. So again, my name is Kimber McKay. I'm a, a professor here in public health and also the director of global P public health, which is one of our interdisciplinary international minors on campus. And I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker this um, spring, who is Dr. Anna Winners. Anna is known to many of um, us already. Uh, and she did her training as a spatial epidemiologist um, in her master's and PhD, and also worked at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Anna has worked globally, focusing her efforts on vector-borne disease, including dengue and malaria, about which she has spoken previously in our program. And she co-founded ACROSS, which is uh, an organization that provides technical support for disease surveillance and response systems to ministries of health across the global south. So Anna's interest is to apply the power of spatial intelligence to optimize health interventions, bringing impact and equitable health service delivery to the very last mile. So what I've asked Anna to talk about with us today is who finances global health today? What's happening across the industry? And how can we understand the varying um, agendas and needs and interests of some of these different groups? And what does that mean for those of us in public health who seek to work in a very um, productive, supportive and collaborative fashion with the government sector? So with ministries of health and that um, other angle that we frequently encounter in the global health world. So, with that introduction, I will turn things over to Dr. Winters. Great. Thank you, Kimber. Um, hi, Patrick and Kelly. I appreciate you putting all this together. And I'm seeing some familiar faces and names and looking forward to reconnecting with a lot of you and, and meeting those that I don't yet know. Uh, like Kimber said, I'm Anna Winters. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, at least from my perspective, what global financing looks like, what it holds, and, and then particularly um, from more of an implementer and a leader of an organization that implements public health, I'd like to talk about what does it look like from our end? And as an organization, um, how do we ensure that the strategies and the directions from ministries of health internationally really do reverberate and reflect um, in the larger scale financing. So we'll get a little bit more into the weeds about how we do that 
at ACROSS. And uh, in that way, I also wanna share a little bit about what ACROSS does. I'll do that a little bit later in, in the presentation. So let me go ahead and share some slides here. Um, I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. I won't keep it so long so we can have some discussion maybe towards the end. Okay, great. Um, so let's start first with some context. Um, and that is where most of the work that, that ACROSS does um, is, is in Southern Africa. We do a bit in Asia as well. Um, and I, I like to, particularly as an epidemiologist, start here with the tangible reality of public health um, in some of these settings. So I, uh, I have spent the last 15 years or so living in Southern Africa, primarily in a country named Zambia, but also South Africa. And this is a shot on the left of my typical commute home um, from our, our ACROSS office there in Zambia. And when I moved to Zambia about 15 years ago, uh, the uh, graveside sites, so this is a primary cemetery there on the left in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, those, those grave uh, sites and gravestones started about 100 meters off the road. And when I left Zambia uh, about a year ago, those, uh, those headstones had really moved up to the side of this road. It caused a lot of traffic jams and was tr truly a real tangible way to look at some of these uh, real life numbers of what's happening in public health. Um, Zambia has definitely suffered from some challenging uh, epidemics of HIV, malaria, um, diarrheal diseases are some of the primary uh, causes of morbidity and mortality there in that country. And, you know, I believe that particularly as epidemiologists, as clinicians, as program managers, students that are looking at information and data and monitoring and evaluation all the time, we sometimes forget that these are real lives and these are real people. And we have um, such opportunity as public health professionals to change the game on the ground for kids like these. And uh, I see that as such uh, an immense opportunity. And when I got into public health, I didn't envision that I would need to think so much about what does global health financing look like? Who are the primary donors? What do ministries of health um, need and want from their donors, uh, from their governments, and how does this world fit together? And it's big and it's fragmented and it's taken a long time to really understand these financing flows. Um, so I, I want to encourage you that actually this is a really big, big piece and part of the global health field, one that's extremely important and one that uh, as a lead of a global health agency, we spend a lot of time looking at. So let's start with just some, some general data. I'll say that this, the data that I'm sharing here is, um, much of it is from IHME, a couple of Lancet articles. I've tried to highlight these if you wanna go and have a read at some of these articles and resources. First main general question is how much money is spent on global health annually? Um, and it's approximately $8 trillion. These are, of course, figures that uh, I can hardly grapple with, but it's, it's quite a bit of money. Um, that's about 10% of the global economy. And you can really think about those resources divided into four main buckets. So let's start with those, the blue bucket, the go government health spending. Uh, you can see that that's the majority of, of the finances available for global health, particularly aimed uh, at high income countries. Out of pocket spending um, makes up that green band there, prepaid private health spending, more or less insurance. And then this, this, pot, this bucket called development assistance for health. Uh, in the health financing, health economy world, that's DAH. I don't claim to be a health economist at all, um, but you can see that that's a very small percentage of the total amount of spend uh, across uh, the global economy for health. But that 0.2% uh, 
is extremely important. And let's get into a little more about what development assistance for health actually is. Um, jumping down into the health spending numbers a little bit more, that first column that you see on the leftmost side of this bar graph is all about health spending. Uh, we say that about 80%, that dark blue uh, color is focused in uh, high income countries. Uh, so 80% of the global health spending is focused in Europe, Canada, United States, for example. But then if we look at bar two, we can really start to break down some of the really inequality or inequity that, uh, that persists in the field of global health and global health and economics, where it's only 16% of the total uh, world population falls in those high income countries. And so this is a really simple, easy picture to show that, that uh, much of the spending, most of it, is happening in high income countries. There's a level of inequality there. Uh, DAH or Development Assistance for Health helps in some regards to make up some of that inequality. A quick map again showing this healthcare expenditure. I apologize, this is an older map, but you can see in the United States and up in Alaska, uh, it's where a primary amount of the funds um, or, or the expenditure is focused. Uh, a Europe, Australia, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of darkening in some of these areas of Africa, but in reality, it's very little, little funds in comparison. So if we think about as GDP is increasing in a country, um, how does health spending change? So for one, um, as a country becomes wealthier, heading to the right of the, y, of the X axis here, that government health spending increases. Makes sense. The prepaid health spending also increases and then the out-of-pocket health spending increases. The water level is rising in that country. And then the development assistance for health, these outside funds that may come from a variety of different channels, we'll talk about in a little bit, decreases as those, um, as those countries are, are gaining uh, GDP. So there is an evolution of health spending as countries move the, the mark towards improvement in their GDP. Okay, I mentioned earlier that 0.2% of the total global spending is represented in DAH or Development uh, Assistance for Health. And that totals about 41 billion. Uh, those funds are primarily targeted towards what we call low and lower middle income countries. Uh, those countries may have uh, an absence of um, uh, robust government. Uh, there may be uh, a real gap there in terms of a Ministry of Health Ministry of Education, actually being able to uh, pay for much of the health services that do happen within that country. So to give a very specific example um, of HIV and AIDS, the total spend globally um, for HIV and AIDS support, um, testing, surveillance, um, uh, the drugs related to HIV, um, the policy making, field work, that is all represented um, uh, uh, where DAH or the Development Assistance for Health make up about half of that. So it's quite significant. Um, and that is something, of course, that grew with both the, the involvement of the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, and those coming on board, but then also through the uh, epidemic pandemic of HIV um, in the 90s, basically, in, in, in uh, Africa. So DIH can also provide some level of support for what we would call global goods. This might be research in neglected tropical diseases. Neglected tropical diseases like schistosomiasis, for example, um, does have a, a huge tax on countries in, in lower middle income countries, for example, and the people there. But it's not necessarily an economically advantageous disease uh, to focus research on it. 
uh, perhaps the drug companies and pharmaceuticals are not too excited about schistosomiasis. Uh, however, the, the countries themselves, and again, I'm thinking about many of the countries I've worked in in Africa, uh, these are some real specific challenges and morbidity and mortality um, taxes there. So let's talk about where these, these development funds come from. As Americans, we have been quite generous um, that we are and have been for some time uh, one of the largest providers of DAH, uh, 12.2 billion annually. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, BMGF, is the largest um, organization or NGO that has, or fill in, fill in, philanthropic organization providing $4 billion a year. Uh, the UK as well at three and a half. And then Germany, Japan, Norway, China, these other countries are also coming on board more and more and providing um, development uh, funds as well. So you can see that, that we are growing as a, a global economy and as a world, um, sharing some of these uh, burden, if you will, of caring for and providing this type of development assistance for lower middle income countries. Now, this is uh, a, as simple as we can really break it down in terms of the type of organizations that both gather and then also distribute development funds. And this, this is a complex environment, so I wanna simplify this as much as possible and then we can get into some of the specifics if you'd like. But at the top here, this top box, funding sources, national treasuries, um, uh, private philanthropies like BMGF, debt, debt repayments, these are some of the primary funding sources uh, that are moving into DAH. And then in that middle band, these are the channels of assistance. These are the organizations that have some level of engagement and relationship with ministries of health and other ministerial bodies sitting in lower middle income and lower income countries. These are GAVI. Um, these are non-government organizations, um, the Global Fund, UN agencies, um, anywhere from WHO, PAHO, UNICEF, uh, the EU, or the European Commission, excuse me, and then bilateral assistance agencies. An example of that from the US perspective would be uh, the United States Agency for International Development or USAID, which is our primary development arm of the US government. And so we, we provide a, a significant amount of resources to development through USAID. And finally, that bottom band, these are the implementing institutions. These are the institutions that are on the ground um, that are delivering these public health resources that are um, pulling together the health management information systems, the surveillance systems uh, that are getting drugs to those most at need, um, the national ministries of health, uh, if you haven't worked in an international setting before, you can kind of think of this as an equivalent to the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States. Um, under National Ministries of Health, we typically have different disease-related programs. So we might have sitting under a Ministry of Health, a National Malaria Control Program, uh, for example. And that program and the staff, the government staff within that program, uh, are the primary operators and deliverers of those um, implementations of malaria programs in that case. We also have um, NGOs that are sitting on the ground uh, in these countries, um, private sector contractors. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And in fact, ACROS could be considered both a private sector contractor as we are a for-profit or institution uh, within the United States, but we also act as a um, NGO within several different countries as well. Um, so we kind of can cover both bases. And then finally, universities and research institutions, which are extremely important um, and provide a, a, a strong degree of research uh, m and support within many of these countries. 
And when I first looked at this figure, I had to look at it three times and then I squinted my eyes and that helped. This is a, a can gives you a sense, I think, of how complex this environment is. So squint at that figure, look at the flows by color. And then let's talk about these three sort of Y axes. On the left, the source. Uh, that was that top bar in the previous slide. This is the donors, the primary donors, um, the philanthropic uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the country treasuries, the United States, for example, being at the very bottom there. And then in the middle, these are the channels. These are, that's that middle tier in that previous slide. This is how the money goes from the treasuries through these channels to the implementing organizations on the ground. So this is the Global Fund. This is Gavi. Uh, this is um, European Commission. And these are some of the bilaterals. Uh, I mentioned earlier, USAID would sit in the middle of this channel or sit in the middle um, bar there of that graph. And then on the very right, these are more of the implementers on the ground. Um, this is where the money is going. This is how the money is being um, utilized and uh, resourced uh, for purchase of pharmaceuticals, for the surveillance, the m and &E, et cetera. So you can see just by this picture, the takeaway really is it's complex. There's a lot of money moving. Uh, there's many different players. Uh, and I think another takeaway here would be the United States does play a very significant role. However, other countries are coming on board as well as the primary sources of these funds. So um, this is an article that I actually read for the first time the other day when I was putting this together. And it's a good article. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It's recent and it talks about um, as, uh, as we become a globalized economy, uh, that there is a high degree of fragmentation in global health. And it causes real problems. Um, why is there such fragmentation? You can see some of these uh, a, some of these reasons, problems of global leadership, for example, differing agendas across these big um, uh, organizations, problems of accountability, power relations. Uh, for example, in countries uh, we've worked in, the ministries of health are, of course, the primary institutions within those countries, but then they have donors that because they're bringing funds into that country, exert some level of power. And so in reality, the, main, the question becomes, well, who is primarily responsible for the strategic plan for health within the country of Zambia? It should be, from my perspective, the Ministry of Health. That should be an internally driven decision. However, because there are many different donors, USAID, UK through uh, DIVID, um, the EU, uh, because there are primary a number of donors circling around these ministries of health, there are power relations, there's challenges. Those donors have some level of certain agendas that they wanna get done. Uh, and they need to come back, for example, to their um, you, you, the U.S. Um, taxpayers and also report what is being done with those funds. So it's a, it's a complex environment. Um, I see that at the global level. I also see the repercussions of that complex environment at the local level. So an example there would be, let's say that I'm working in an extremely rural health facility in the northwestern province of Zambia. I have uh, a lot, I have a long line of uh, individuals seeking help every morning. I show up at work at 7 a.m. and those people have been standing outside the door since five. Um, so there's a lot of work going on and I have myself and then uh, two other nurses and my data technician. Now that data technician may be responsible for providing monitoring and evaluation data in five different uh, formats for five different donors. This is an example of even the fragmentation and the repercussions of that type of fragmentation on the health system, even at the most local of level. Okay, so uh, this, this slide is another rendition of really uh, who are the players 
when it comes to distributing global health uh, funds and finances. Again, here at the in the middle, that, that orange color are the um, primary uh, donors. The greenish color are those channels who were pushing the money through. And then the gray, the outside circle there, are more of the on the ground organizations. Now, I've put in a couple of logos of various organizations that can be considered implementers. Commonix, PATH, Apt Associates, the End Phone Fund, CARE, uh, ACROSS would be one of these uh, implementers as well. Uh, you may have heard the, some of these names. Uh, some of these can be considered in the United States by the term Beltway Bandits. Uh, the meaning there is many of these organizations have large offices in the United States within the Beltway, and they have or you try to build tight relationships with the US government to ensure that they become the contractors that implement these funds from the US government. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how ACROSS internally works to find the funds, uh, to make decisions about how philosophically we seek these funds and work with both the ministries of health, so these country governments, while simultaneously having good discussions with the donor agencies and how, again, philosophically, we at ACROSS and myself personally feel that many of these decisions um, can be made. So ACROSS, uh, like Kimber mentioned earlier, is an organization that works in Southern, uh, Western Africa, primarily. We're doing a bit of work in Thailand now. Um, the organization's about 13, 14 years old at this stage. Uh, I co-founded the organization after coming out of the Centers for Disease Control and um, working quite a bit in some of these Southern African countries. Um, ACROSS has a team of about 40 people. Uh, we, our primary office is in Zambia, which this dot should be sitting in. So that's actually sitting in Botswana. That's, that's incorrect. But our primary office and where many of my staff sit is in Zambia. Um, although we do have a number of regional staff now um, and extending into Kenya and Rwanda. So this map does need to be updated the type of work that ACROSS does. Um, here you can, say, you can see and read that we work very, very close with country governments. Um, our real aim, our mission is to um, drive impact to disadvantaged communities. But the way we do that is to assist governments in um, in implementing data-driven systems. So that means understanding in a very, very simple sense where is the high risk? Where is the low risk for certain diseases? And are we um, running the surveillance and the monitoring and evaluation to such a degree that we can then make sure that health resources are getting to where they need them? In short, let's help governments better spend their resources and monitor that they're really making great impact. That's really what ACROSS is, is all about. This is a couple of pictures that kind of give you a sense of uh, some of the work we do and I guess how we look. <laughs> Bottom left there, uh, you can see a good amount of our team. Um, we work very, very closely, like I said, with Ministry of Health governments, um, ministries of health, ministries of chiefs and traditional affairs, which are more related to governance in many countries, Ministry of Education, we have done some education work, uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, some of our work is focused on actual health service delivery. So on the left here is a community health worker who is delivering rapid diagnostic tests for malaria. Uh, if the women on the right test positive, that community health worker would be providing anti-malarials there on the spot. And uh, we have worked with the Ministry of several different governments to help capture that information quickly so ministers can understand in real time where are the high risk of malaria? And really from a surveillance standpoint, what's happening in, in the case of many of these different diseases is really often falls under the umbrella of information systems. So um, an effort not to leave you with too many acronyms, HMIS stands for Health Management Information System. That's usually the primary and central database 
of a country government that deals with health. Uh, and this can be for and should be for uh, really all the infectious diseases and chronic diseases uh, within that country that are being tracked. I mentioned earlier, we do and continue to do uh, quite a bit of malaria. I have a malaria background. So we started um, doing quite a bit of implementation and surveillance for malaria and then the lessons learned, the tools built, the innovation that uh, our teams have created. We've moved into other areas of health as well. Um, neglected tropical diseases is one primary one at this moment, as well as HIV. And then a bit of work in education as well, which really links with um, water and sanitation and school led total sanitation, which is sanitation, which is happening uh, in these schools alongside education. Okay, so how do organizations like ACROS help countries achieve health impact? Um, this really, I think comes down at first and foremost to philosophically, what does this mean uh, to us? Um, we as an organization have taken both pride and, and really prioritized understanding the context of the on the ground. Uh, what are the needs? What uh, are the strategic plans of ministers of government, of provincial staff, of district staff? Um, where are they wanting to go with um, their health and how do they want to do that? And that is a listening ear and that is very much a relational type of approach. Uh, we do very little of swinging quickly into a, into a country and bringing with us um, highly innovative tools and laying them over what's already going on there. From our perspective, that truly is not the way to both establish positive working relationships uh, with uh, ministers and ministries of health. Uh, rather, we do this in a more slow, uh, slow way, a relational way. Uh, we have staff on the ground. We, uh, you know, probably I would say about seventy-five percent of our staff. Uh, are uh, local to the countries we're working in. So philosophically, the way we think about this is that governments where we're working are our primary clients. That's who we want to be listening to the most. Uh, we want to stand with those governments to help them achieve uh, their, their strategy and their direction. But then we are also responsible to not only hear what those governments want to do and where they want to go, but to also communicate that to donors. So, uh, and we do that on behalf and alongside ministries of health. So the type of donors uh, that are pushing again, the development assistance for health funds uh, that ACROS lays is with uh, are here, USAID. Again, that's United States Agency for international development. This is the primary arm of the US government that focuses on development funds, including health. Uh, Gavi, uh, which is focused primarily on vaccination. They're based in Geneva. Global Fund, GF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does provide some funding for us. Um, the END Fund is focused entirely on neglected tropical diseases. We're doing surveillance work with them and uh, UNICEF as well. So these have been the primary donors that we liaise with. I would add to that list um, the UK as well and their um, development arm, which is uh, titled DIVID. So how do we do this? Um, several different ways. I would say that one of our primary jobs is writing proposals, um, keeping uh, strong relationships with key staff within these donor agencies, um, looking for RFPs, requests for proposals, structuring uh, an, entire, um, uh, an entire area and section of our staff purely focused on what we call business development. Uh, so this is a large, large task. It's a lot of what we do at ACROSS. We're not only always, always looking for funds, always writing grants. We're also, of course, managing then the bringing in of those grants, uh, the work planning to determine alongside ministries of health, how will we execute these monies? Uh, how will we um, uh, build uh, 
uh, and in help improve existing surveillance systems on the ground uh, it really depends upon the nature of those funds and exactly uh, the implementation work that we're doing. And then, of course, reporting back to the donors uh, what's happened and doing that with a very strong monitoring and evaluation framework. So that's absolutely key to this work. Um, ACROSS is an organization that is quite innovative. We uh, have always taken a stance that we want to uh, push forward the agenda of context appropriate innovations. Again, understanding what's going on the ground, listening to what is needed, and trying to um, think of smart, innovative ways to uh, gain their impact. Um, so this is another, I would say, flavor of the type of proposals that we write. So to give you a snapshot of what that looks like as an organization and, and the lead of an organization like ACROSS, um, we're busy. In 2020, our business development team of about four people um, wrote 52 proposals that title, totaled a uh, writing for $52 million. Um, we have about a 42% win rate uh, in 2020. And so the total amount of funds that we were then implementing in 2020 was about $5 million uh, across those various countries that you saw earlier. So it's a big, big area. And like I said earlier, we went into public health thinking that we're focused on getting health to people and, and looking at exciting data. And that's a big part of our job, of course. But uh, I would venture to say an even bigger part has been um, really looking at how do we best structure grant proposals? How do we write them well? Uh, how do we do the monitoring and evaluation around those and report well? And so I just, have, go ahead. Can you hear me? Um, I'm just gonna jump in and give you a three to five minute warning. Great. So we can leave time for questions and we've already got one in the chat, so. Good, okay. We'll Perfect timing then. Um, Instead of answer these big looming questions that uh, that are part and parcel to some of the global financing uh, for health, I want to leave some of these with us. We can talk about them now. I would also say these might be great fodder for upcoming seminars um, as well. But you know, we, we're talking. We, we've gone through the uh, eight trillion dollar annually of investments in global health. Um, and a big question is what does the future look like in terms of investment? Um, how can these funds be spent better to gain more impact? Because we still have a long way to go in terms of development goals and reducing the levels of morbidity and mortality around the world. Uh, this is a large area that I think all of us need to be asking uh, questions around. Um, COVID-19, I certainly don't need to sit here and tell us all that this is a massive, um, massive situation in the global health community um, across the world. And a big question here is now that the world has in their radar health, global health, the need for surveillance, the need for monitoring and evaluation, for quick creation of vaccines and distributing those What's the, what is the impact going to look like of this global pandemic? We're hitting these high income countries um, because we've suffered as high income countries from COVID-19. Um, but simultaneously, we're seeing particularly in Southern Africa, a second wave here um, of the variant of COVID-19 and we're running out of ICU beds in many of those countries. So this is a, this is a real area uh, where I'm really interested in what that will look like. Um, another area, big question, and a philosophical question at that is, um, global health has had at its history colonialism, uh, where foreign assistance, for better or for, better, for worse, has, um, for example, worked in Africa to reduce malaria, morbidity, and mortality to ensure that mining production was, um, in, was kept at high levels. Uh, this level of colonialism and approach, there are still some tangible um, realities of that in many countries that I've worked in. Uh, how can we make this a equitable um, uh, type of foreign assistance is a large question in my mind. So I think I'll stop there. I mentioned that there's some reading material and resources um, Patrick, I'm not sure if you'll be sharing these slides, but do feel free to explore these um, links. 
Uh, I hope that you'll find them helpful. My email and my phone number is there. I am in Missoula now uh, and looking forward to working with all of you closer, I hope. Thanks so much. Anna, thank you so much um, as well. That was fascinating. And I think laid a really nice foundation for the series. Uh, as you said, you came into this global health space not imagining how much time you were going to spend thinking about <laughs> financing it. <laughs> Right. And that's certainly been um, my experience as well. And I think that it's really good for our students and our colleagues in, in the field to be aware of how many um, complexities are at play and, and what, what, how they factor into your everyday life on the ground. Um, I have a question of my own that I'd like to pose at some point, um, but I would first want to take the question from the chat box, which um, came from Dr. Nancy Fitch and um, Nancy, are you? Do you want to click over and unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question was uh, for the speaker. I noted that you said HMISs are designed for tracking infectious and chronic diseases, and as a primary care physician who spent 10 years or more in Africa helping scale up HIV, it always broke my heart to see these amazing Cadillac HMIS systems for HIV only, and mm -hmm. yet it didn't track maternal child deaths, which you didn't include in what HMISs are for. And most of the time, primary health care centers, if they had a computer, it was only to report HIV data. So, it, so to me, I guess the fragmentation reflected the fragmentation in HMIS has reflected the fragmentation in funding because um, it, it, you had to report on where the money went. And I, I guess um, as ACROS does seem to put emphasis on HMIS, is, are, do you have thoughts on this? I sure do. Nancy, lovely to meet you. Um, I, so my experience of health management information systems at HMIS, uh, I would agree with you that, you know, the US government through PEPFAR, their primary, uh, the largest um, funding focus has been HIV. Um, and so that has really led from my perspective, a siloed approach when mm -hmm. it comes to HIV data. Um, we can talk about you know, the way Centers for Disease Control have created something called smart care that acts at a clinic level and is basically electronic card for individuals coming into those clinics. And um, the HMIS systems to date that we have worked on, and we've done uh, probably about 10 or 11, we've worked with 10 or 11 countries on their central HMIS. They are capturing HIV data. They are capturing maternal child health data, um, as well as just primary and chronic, or chronic and infectious diseases, excuse me. Um, however, you're absolutely right. The, the level of health indicators, the data elements and indicators in those HMIS can sometimes be over 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, there is been such a push from a variety of donors. Well, we, we need to capture this. We need to be tracking this. Uh, and that just adds and adds to the complexity of the number of indicators within an HMIS. Uh, as sort of a, an illustration there, we did one project where when we encountered, the first time we encountered this HMIS, there were 50, there were over 50,000 health indicators in that system. So many were um, archaic. And so we went through a very structured process where we held stakeholder meetings with the Ministry of Health. We brought all the partners together and we said, okay, in order to ensure that we're achieving high reporting rates over time, we need to reduce these numbers. What are your key and core indicators? And can we start sharing those across donors? Uh, and so when that project closed, I don't remember the number of indicators we brought it down to, but it was significant. It was basically cleaning it out and ensuring that these donors were talking closely with ministries and agreeing on what indicators they'd be willing to capture. Yeah, um, I had the privilege of working with Sri Lanka recently and they 
on a $20 million global fund award just to reintegrate HMISs. So, I mean, in some ways we're creating a toxic mess over there with all the vertical programs. Mm, yeah, and from my perspective, again, you know, the one of the best things that I think we can do for a Ministry of Health government is provide internal funds for their health management information team mm -hmm. uh, so that there is strong education within that team and ownership, and leadership, yeah. leadership yeah. within that team so that they that team can say to these donors, um, no, we're going to limit the total number of indicators. Right. Again, that leadership happening from within. And include spread beyond the specific disease programs too. Yeah. Include primary care. Mm -hmm. And linking primary care facilities to referral services too. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And you don't have to refer the patient. You can yeah. Thank you so much, Nancy. That, those were really good and well-informed <laughs> well questions. And Anna, we've got another in um, the chat box, which I think came just to me from um, one of our PhD students, Joshua Brown, who asks how neoliberalism impacts global health work financing. <laughs> Big question. That's a huge question. Joshua, you may have to define to me what neoliberalism is. You want to jump in, Josh? We might not actually have time to, to even get the definition of neoliberalism out on the table. I'm just minding the clock. Josh, you wanna jump in? Or if not, you can dialogue um, separately with, with Anna. I don't see him. Yeah. Um, so it was something I forgot to mention at the start was that Anna is um, born and bred in Montana and has recently returned to live here in Missoula um, with her family. And so um, that means that having a dialogue with her, um, either in person at some point in time, hopefully soon when COVID lets go of us or by email is um, that much more possible um, because she's here with us in our community and hopefully we'll be more and more integrated with the School of Public and Community Health Sciences. So Anna, I'm, I'm just looking at the time and, and my question had to do with what happens when you make the mistake um, as a non-government organization of not working with governments. Um, and I don't know that in two minutes you can address that, um, but that sure. was what I was wondering about. Sure, um, well, on a large scale, what happens is further fragmentation. And so an example of not working with a government can look like, or not understanding the context and knowing all, what all is happening at a country context can look like a new fancy tool to capture data, uh, a mobile phone that um, does really exciting things from our end, from maybe an academic standpoint, or we're excited about the data that it captures. But in reality, there's already paper-based or local systems that are doing that. Uh, so duplication, fragmentation, what that looks like in terms of a um, relational approach, um, detrimental, particularly if you are looking to work in that country for long periods of time. Um, you, you know, are on a relational basis, that means that ministries of health are no longer excited to, um, to share resources, information, uh, you, you're no longer collaborating. Thanks, Anna. Um, Josh, Josh just texted or in the chat um, said that he is, he's lost his voice with a scratchy throat and I'm actually in the same boat. So I awesome. heard bronchitis is going around on top of everything else. So mm. Josh, I'm sorry, we, we aren't gonna have time to um, follow up on neoliberalism and your very excellent question about its impact. But I think, um, although we can't do that today, we will actually return to that later in the semester because it's something that other speakers um, will be addressing. Um, I see that we're at 2.50, so I think I will um, close the session for today and remind people that next week our visitors are Brooke Magnuson and Heidi Nakamura from Adara Development Group, which is actually an organization that I helped launch myself a number of years ago in the late 1990s. Um, they're going to come in and join us and talk about uh, a project that Adara has in, uh, also in Sub-Saharan Africa 
in Uganda, and it's called Hospital to Home. The title of their talk is Caring for Vulnerable NICU Graduates in a Rural Ugandan Setting. And Brooke uh, works with Adara as um, somebody who is on the partnership side, so she's very um, busy talking to donors and the kinds of players that Anna highlighted in her um, earlier in her remarks and also is involved in managing the often very complex moving parts of a big grant um, for an initiative like the Hospital to Home One. Heidi um, is a nurse by training, a NICU nurse by training, and worked for decades in the, um, in the NICU setting in Seattle, and also has worked extensively in East Africa, um, training uh, NICU nurses and um, looking after those very vulnerable um, people who live in them, um, the babies and their parents and their families after they graduate the NICU and then and go home into their communities, which is, I always thought was sort of akin to leaving a spaceship and then going out and returning to your home. And many of those homes are, are quite modest and might have dirt floors or very, very different um, setting to what um, the babies were born into. And so um, they're again going to give us a sort of multidisciplinary holistic approach um, or perspective, uh, considering both the clinical and, and other disciplinary angles that had to come together to make that, um, to get the funding for that project and also to um, execute it on the ground. So we can look forward to that next week. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you all so much, especially um, you, Dr. Winters, for your generosity and reflections are, was very interesting and for the questions. And I hope to see everybody next week. That's it for now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kimber. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.